So, uh, thanks for coming. As I said, my name is Trevor Pascal. And, uh, yeah, this talks about design engineering. So, all my life, I've been really passionate about creating things. And, you know, as a kid, I remember Christmas presents, like the ones I remember anyways, being like, you know, bags of rubber bands and like rolls of tape and soldering irons. So, I, you know, I, I was kind of always into that kind of stuff. And I, I've always loved the process of creation because it, you can take an idea and you can turn it into something you can play with and something you can use, something you can enjoy. And when I was 16, I tested out of high school and began working right away, contracting as a user interface designer for a firm that my neighbor happened to, to own. And uh, I really loved working as a designer. It was really great, but I, I felt like something was missing. I wanted to be able to make my designs do things. And I was really interested in creating games and graphics applications. So I enrolled in a programming class at a nearby community college. And my time in that classroom convinced me I was never going to be an engineer. I would never be a programmer. And after I dropped the class, I felt really defeated. Like, not really sure what was going on. Like, was I not smart enough to, to learn how to program? And I thought, I mean, I taught myself how to do a lot of things. And I taught myself how to play musical instruments and how to make films. And, and also, I, I taught myself how to work um, doing user interface design. So I felt like maybe I'd just taken the wrong approach to learning how to program. So a few months later, I sat down with an HTML version of a C++ book and just did it myself. And I was hooked after a short period of time. I, since then, I've learned more languages. I really love programming. So either I suck at college or that teacher was rubbish, but it sort of doesn't matter. I'm just glad I found my way. And over time, I, I developed a, like a small consulting business and you know, had more clients. And I got involved in open source. And as a contractor, clients would give me projects ranging from like video production, 3D animation, I don't know, any, any kind of stuff I could do, print design. But also, I did a lot of software engineering jobs and, and everything in between. And all these skills would work together to make me more valuable. As I expanded my skill set, my clients were happier, and you know every, everything worked better. It's what I love about consulting. It's, it's what I miss about consulting. What I don't love about consulting is how isolated you are. Anyone who's ever done contract work can, can definitely relate. You don't have a bunch of peers that you're sharing ideas with. And early in my career, I did receive some mentorship uh, at that firm that was doing UI design. And that helped me a lot. And I got a lot of mentorship uh, at different points in time from open source. So I mean, I had a feeling of how, how important that was. But I, I just felt like as, as my career was progressing, something was missing. So I began to look for a real job for the first time in my life at the age of 24. And I'd never really seen what a job description looks like for a tech company. I had, I had no clue. I was amazed. They were so narrow. There was like engineering positions or design positions, and there was not really anything that crossed over at all. And after spending all this time broadening my skill set, which I thought was the way to go, uh, I was forced to reconsider my approach. Like maybe I'd, maybe I'd missed out on this crucial idea of specialization. I, I applied for a, a bunch of different positions, some design, some engineering, and all, all different parts of the stack. I wasn't really sure yet what small field I was going to relegate myself to for the next several years. While I was searching, I, I took a short-term gig uh, working on an embedded Linux system. I, I just, I really didn't know where I was going to go. Uh, after a few interviews, I realized, for sure, companies were looking for specialists. I considered maybe I should divide my resume into sub-resumes and each tailored to a different field to make it look like I was more of a specialist. Uh, I wondered how trapped I was going to feel in a job with such a narrow description. I was worried I might pick the wrong one and I'd miss terribly working in a different field that I used to get to work in all the time. 
So finally, I found a position working at a nonprofit organization that runs Wikipedia. It's called the Wikimedia Foundation. It, especially at the time, it was a very small shop. I think I was like the 20th employee or something. And uh, everything was open source, and it was, it was just a really open culture. It seemed like a good fit for me. Um, they, and they, they seemed to view my broad experience as, as sort of a plus. So I, I gave it a shot. And although I was hired as an engineer, shortly after, I was stuck on a project to make it easier to use Wikipedia. So I felt maybe my broad skill set was going to be put to use after all. But what I realized soon after is even the most open-minded organizations are deeply entrenched with prejudice. Because my title was software engineer, I was, for the first time in my career, no longer a designer. People didn't trust me. People didn't look, you know, think to ask me about these types of things. And if I had opinions, they would consider them useless. And uh, after many hard-fought battles, I, I mean, I feel like I've made my place there, and I, we figured it out. I'm, I'm very involved in both design and engineering at the Wikimedia Foundation. But my title still says engineer, and as long as it does, I'm always going to I'm always going to experience some level of prejudice. In my experience in modern society, and in tech culture in particular, we've become obsessed with specialization. It can be seen in the way universities teach, and the way companies hire, the way open source meritocracies are run. I believe this commitment to intellectual monogamy is destructive. When we limit ourselves to a narrow, focused area of expertise, we become more territorial. Barriers to entry are erected around the specialized fields. They're made of nomenclature, terminology, litmus tests. These barriers, they discourage newcomers. And they propagate prejudice towards the people who are outside those barriers. Intellectual monogamy, it's, it's also quite ineffective. I, I mean, it narrows your perspective from like, the way you view all problems. It, it, it like limits your lateral thinking abilities, which is your ability to think about a problem from a lot of different angles. And, it, and most of all, it stresses the limits of human communication. Because if everybody is a super expert in one thing, then the only way that you can come up with a solution to a problem that's more complex than that one narrow field can handle, you're going to have to communicate with other people who are super experts. And you open yourself up to the gaps. And it, it's, it's, you end up having overly sized teams. It's like the mythical man month issue. And all this dividing can get in the way of conquering. But sadly, if you do take a more distributed approach, you risk becoming known as a jack of all trades and master of none. To be clear, intellectual promiscuity is no better than intellectual monogamy. Certainly, there are some people who achieve significant breadth and depth. Leonardo da Vinci is regarded as a polymath. It's, polymath is basically anybody who has like, significant knowledge in multiple fields. In his case, it was especially known to be art and science. He was like, a true Renaissance man. He could also be described as an intellectual polygamist. His deep commitments to both art and science were complementary and empowering. They were not a dilution of his potential. But during the Renaissance, things were different. Leon Battista Alberti said, a person, I think he said man originally, can do all things if they will. This concept is known as Renaissance humanism. It boils down to a belief that humans have limitless capacity to develop and that they should develop skills in all areas. The thing is, both intellectual monogamy and promiscuity, they have the same problem. They're single dimensions. And when you're, when you're up against this, you get linear gains. But if we can increase both breadth and depth, we get quadratic gains in our total area of expertise. But this begs the question, 
whether this is even achievable by most of us. Many people think that the da Vinci's of the world have greater innate talents than others. Innate talent, however, we don't even know if it's real or not. No one's really proven this before. And it, even if innate talent does exist, it's severely overrated. Either way, it's not what it seems. The thing is, the notion of talent is very similar to luck. Both are poorly understood, and they're often given undue credit. The causes of these phenomena are divided into two categories. Internal forces, which we can control, and external ones we can't. Louis Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. What I read when I, when I see this is that luck is nothing more than preparation and opportunity. You can't win the lotto if you don't buy a ticket. In the case of talent, one might say that nurture favors the diligent mind. It's a similar concept with slightly different inputs and outputs. Open source must be a community dedicated to supporting people in a variety of fields, not just engineering, so that the diligent can best develop the skills that we need to accomplish our shared goals. And the truth is, open source has been really successful this way with engineers. I've experienced firsthand. The mentorship and support that most projects provide contributors, it's, it's amazing. And what's great is that it turns people into these very talented, skilled people that are set on giving back and sticking around. But is that the experience of a designer in an open source project? Surely it depends on the project. I don't mean to generalize as much as I'm criticizing uh, that <laughs> generalization. But observationally, it seems to me that in the majority of cases, participants with such ambitions are left alone and uninspired. And to be frank, in most cases, these designers, they're not even prepared for the opportunities that are being presented to them. And what I mean by that is that we need designers who understand the value of CC by SA, who embrace working with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They should see static Photoshop mockups as a novelty, empowered by attribution and establishing their, their value through collective accomplishments. Genuine open source designers. If we want people like this, we must take responsibility for making sure that open source is a place where they're at home. But we also must stop accepting anything less and demand excellence without fear or hesitation. What I've learned from my experience contributing to open source projects is that most of my fellow contributors work in the tech industry to make a living. What I've learned from working in the tech industry is that the tech industry divides the fields of design and engineering much more than they really need to be. As a, re as a result, these two groups, they end up having an incredibly low expectations of mutual knowledge. If a designer hands an engineer graphics assets that have been prepared with no thought given to the medium which they're to be realized, they are a bad engineer, or they're a bad designer, sorry. Just, I mean, like a print designer needs to know about four color process and how to prepare graphics, uh, you know, for press. And so too must a web designer understand HTML and CSS and how to optimize things for the web. But we don't, we don't see this a lot. But to be fair, if an engineer creates a product that's user interface can't be changed without major code changes, they are a bad engineer. If you're writing a program a human is meant to use, you should be concerned with use cases. And understand that a lot of times it takes all the iteration until you can perfect that. You should anticipate that. Even if you're writing a library or an API, humans are still using that. They're just programmers. And user experience is important to them too. 
it should be important to all engineers. But what's dangerous is when we no longer expect such basic knowledge from each other. The funny or perhaps tragic thing about expectations is that people, they rarely exceed them. They'll live up to them, but they rarely exceed them. We should expect more. No, it's okay. <laughs> I have nothing to show. <laughs> we should expect more out of each other. We shouldn't be afraid to criticize. We shouldn't be afraid to be critical of people who aren't living up to those expectations. If somebody can't take criticism, they aren't dedicated enough to their craft to be taken seriously. Being willing to fight to maintain high standards does not make you a bad person. It makes you a leader. A few years ago, at a soulless corporate conference in this very city, I sat down in an enormous convention center ballroom. That was like 10% full. I was excited to attend the only design talk on the whole schedule. Roan was with me. What followed was 45 minutes of bad advice and offensive prejudice. But more concerning than the speaker's misguided remarks and ironically poorly designed slide deck was how much the audience appeared so comfortable with her dogmatic sentiments and bigoted slurs. The talk was called How Not to Design Like an Engineer. Throughout the talk, two common stereotypes were referred to again and again, designer and engineer. Like all stereotypes, these incite prejudice. But just as not all Italians are mobsters, not all engineers are aesthetically impaired, and not all designers are impractical. As progressive and evolved as we may think we are, the truth is that most of us are still pretty prejudiced in this area. What does it mean to design like an engineer anyway? She went on to advise engineers to do whatever it takes to get a designer involved and then to obey their every whim without question. And that was the only way to achieve a product that was well designed. Given a view of humanity where specialization is the panacea to the limitation, the finite limitation of human capacity, perhaps her remarks weren't that far off. But I do not buy into that view of humanity. None of us should. It was that day I do, that I realized just how bad this really was. And I decided that at least eventually I was going to give this talk. My message is very simple. Designers and engineers should learn each other's craft. If you are a designer, you should learn how to be an engineer and vice versa, especially in open source. Put it another way, become a design engineer. Please don't ever use that actual word. <laughs> DevOps. <sighs> yes, it is. Yes, yes, it is. It just, design engineer just doesn't really look right when you write it out. Yes, yes. Yeah, if you Google design engineer, you get, did you mean design engineer? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it is a GUID. Let's see. So if designers learn engineering, what's, what's in it for them? I think they'll learn the value of open source. And I think they'll start to understand free licensing and remixing and reuse, not things that are running rampant in those communities. They'll become better designers, truthfully, because they'll be moving away from like proprietary graphics tools and they'll start prototyping things instead, using like open formats. They can use collaborative mediums. Photoshop is not collaborative. I know, I've used it a lot. It sucks. The aptitude for details, right? This is something that we commonly attribute to someone who's really passionate about design. They get great attention to detail. That is really useful, especially visual detail. We need that. Our, a lot of code bases could use someone like that. They care about cleanliness. They'll take the time to make sure things are formatted nicely. That's a good thing. 
What's in it for engineers? If engineers learn design skills, they'll realize the value of aesthetic, of aesthetic experiences and become better engineers when you prioritize user experience. I mean, the thing is, if you're building something that someone's going to use and you're not considering the final use case, you might be working on things that aren't even going to be used in the final product, for one. And also, you may have to refactor and refactor and refactor just because you realize, oh, and when they actually use it, I have this problem. It's, it, and it really doesn't matter. Like I said, it, it doesn't matter if it's a user-facing application. I mean, uh, okay, I, I see that user experience is really important when you're making an app that, that an end user uses. But even if you're making an API, does anybody user test their APIs? I mean, maybe you don't have to do it in a formal lab setting, but what about just the guy next to you? Like, how awkward is this to use? Should I really be, you know, doing this dependency injection or you know, all these questions we have? We could just user test them. That's what they do in design. When they don't know what to do, they just, tr they just subject someone to torture until they've figured it out. That might be a little bit of an extreme, but I've seen it firsthand. Uh, I also think that engineers, we kind of have an, we have an aptitude for process optimization. And there's a whole field of design called interaction design. Well, this is really useful. Because interaction design is really nothing more than how can I get the user from point A to point B in as few steps, learning as few things, reading as few things as possible. And that's very similar in a lot of ways to the concept of optimizing code. You're managing the, the, the compromises between CPU and memory. I think beyond that, both groups would benefit from a shared vocabulary. They communicate better solve problems better, they better understand each other, which makes them more empathetic towards each other. And they develop healthier, more supportive relationships. When I began work at the Wikimedia Foundation, I didn't really get on that well with the development community. Rowan might remember. I was a new hire, they'd been around for a long time, most of them had been contributing to this, many of them volunteers, for years. The more knowledge I gained at MediaWiki, the better we got along. It was that mutual knowledge that eventually brought us together. Eventually I became one of them. That shared knowledge creates, it creates a special bond between people. If you've ever seen two people who are like big fans of Rested Development get in the same room, they'll just like sling quotes at each other for hours on end. And that could be all they know about each other and they're like best friends or I'm sure people do the same thing with Doctor Who. I think it's just that mutual understanding. It increases good faith between people. And if there's anything that designers and, and developers could use more of, it's good faith. Bike shedding. This is an incredible phenomenon. People who otherwise know how to choose their battles will spend hours, they will dive in head first and they will devote massive amounts of energy over trivial matters based on opinions. Plato said, opinion is the medium between knowledge and ignorance. I think, that, I think that's pretty reasonable. Engineering, we're hardly immune from this. There's plenty of bike shedding that goes on, especially on mailing lists. But it's really common in collaborative design as well. But the thing is, the solution is exactly the same. No matter what the field, ideas should be tested and then they should be backed with data, the results of those tests. Anything else is just an opinion. We should demand that rigor of other people and we should subject ourselves to that same high standard. And for the record, the bike shed should always be painted green. I want to come back to what I was talking about barriers, barriers to entry. Specialized fields, it's not necessarily that they're trying to build these up, they just they grow organically. And especially the one of, of vocabulary. These words are really useful. They, they help people communicate more efficiently. There's, there's nothing wrong with specialized vocabulary. But if you've ever heard a designer use the word affordance, or if you've ever heard an engineer say the word closure, 
these things don't mean anything to the other group. So the thing is, is that when you have shared vocabulary, it dem when you can use someone else's vocabulary, it demonstrates a certain amount of like respect and value for their field and a recognition of their craft. And when we learn another craft, the barriers come crumbling down. In the project you're working on now, just think, how many of the decisions do I make that are like on my own compared to collaboratively? And maybe it's hard to really come up with a ratio, but there's certainly, there are some that you make like in total autonomy and others that you make as a group. But the thing is, every single decision we make, it has consequences. What's great about consequences, some are intended and some are not. And there's always going to be blind spots that cause these unintended consequences. And in, in hindsight, we call those decisions mistakes. And collaboration with others is typically the way that we try and get rid of those blind spots. We just get more people, more eyes on it. But the problem is, is that this model breaks down at some point because it depends too much on communication and oversight. You have to check in with t nine people just to make a single decision. And it's like death by consensus. So it's reasonable for people to make decisions on their own. Obviously, open source is pretty big on making a lot of community decisions, but there's some level where you make a lot of, a lot of decisions. And the whole bike shed problem is, is that the hard decisions you always end up making on your own. It's the easy decisions that everyone wants to, wants to chime in on. And those hard decisions is usually where the worst bugs and the, you know, the worst errors come from. Because it's not really that big of a bug if the button is slightly different color. So the trick is, is that when you have people with really broad knowledge, it just it covers those gaps without as much dependency on constant checking in and consensus. Surely we should still be talking to each other. But it just it covers the gaps better. We make better decisions. Fewer mistakes will be made. Is there anyone here who is a designer but not an engineer? Okay, I didn't think so. Just, just knowing this conference, and that's okay. My recommendation to them would be basically you should talk to the people around you because you're literally surrounded. But for the rest of you, I will give you some advice. I can't guarantee it's awesome advice, but I will give you some advice if you are considering trying to get into design. First, be patient. Give yourself projects and you need to do it your own way. Patience, patience is really important when you're learning anything. You ever learned another programming language? You know, it's like time consuming, can be very, very challenging. You got to set aside like real time to do this. It's not something you're just going to do like in an afternoon when you feel a little bit bored. At least not if you're going to take it seriously. And you should take time to explore and experiment. Spend some time designing, but also time researching. There's like free courses uh, from major universities. One of my favorite things is like MIT has a lot of like slides from some of their like Media Lab classes on UX, and um, MIT Media Lab especially. They they have a lot of they have a lot of courses that are pretty cognizant about the connections between design and engineering. They really speak well to not just teaching art and then trying to slap it on technology, but really connecting those dots and, and how to improve user interfaces or whatever you're working on. Are those up in Postgres or elsewhere? You know, I'm not sure exactly what the, what the name of it is. I know that they're openly licensed and they're like on their website, but I think their website's like massive, so it's kind of hard to, okay. but there are a lot. And there's even like, there's even like, uh, like uh, what is the iTunes like educational stuff? I don't know. Uh, yeah, iTunes U or some horrible name like that, and like, it's like iSchool or I don't know. And then um, yeah, I mean, there's a like, there's a lot of this stuff. But the truth is that your research it doesn't have to be super structured like that. You could just spend time on the internet, as I'm sure we all do, and just explore. And if you're if you're if you're looking for inspiration, just noticing details, you may find that the world looks a little bit different after a while. If you've ever spent time. I love this comic so much. If you've ever spent time with someone that's like really, really into the way things look, 
you'll notice they're always complaining like, oh my gosh, look at this menu at this restaurant. It has like nine fonts on it. And they're always just, oh, the kerning's off. And I find myself whining about that a bit. But I'm sympathetic. And apparently XKCD is also aware of this phenomenon. So I, unless you're going to take a class that's going to give you assignments, you really, you need to come up with a way to motivate yourself. You're going to have to come up with them yourself, but really the best way, the way that I taught myself uh, was to take on projects for other people for free. Um, I remember when I was a kid, my, my friends were starting a clothing company, and I did like all their website stuff, and I even helped design shirts. When, when you do stuff for free for people, you'll be more motivated to like finish it, but the expectation of quality is a lot lower than when you're charging. And uh, usually, we're, it usually works out a lot better. And, you know, it's like personal projects, they're kind of easy to drop. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna go that route, and I've gone that route a lot, I've done a lot of personal projects that do like expand on my skill set. You just, you gotta be really disciplined. I've also dropped a lot, and that's, that's, that's a lot of time wasted, perhaps. I think it's really, really important to develop your own style. I mean, just as it's so important for people to have varied skill sets, we don't need everybody to be obsessed with minimalism and flatness. I mean, I know that there's like a lot of design trends, and unfortunately, especially when you're getting started, people kind of measure you against how similar to Apple your stuff looks. But that's not really like the measure of like learning how to design. People need their own style. And there are different trends that evolve. Even Apple's now going flat. And, you know, they're ditching all the scutomorphism and, like, pretending it's leather and all that. I mean, every, it, there's always going to be some trend. You shouldn't, shouldn't be too worried about it. If you like something, do it. If, if something catches your interest, that, that's what's more important than trying to fit into someone else's kind of idea of exactly how everything should look. You know, create stuff you like. Find your own way of doing things, your own style, and perfect that. The fact that you're here at this conference tells me a lot about you. I guess that you guys are all engineers. And more than that, I just, I know I'm like, I'm here telling you, you guys should be learning design. It's really important. But don't do it at like the detriment of what makes you guys awesome. You, you know, don't go out and get sucked into the Adobe Vortex and, and, you know, use Git to store your files and put them on GitHub and write meaningful commit messages and continue collaborating. Because like I was saying, if you're going to be an open source designer, you're not mimicking what we've already got probably a lot of. We need something different. We need engineers that are also awesome designers, that really care about stuff, but they take all their good habits of collaboration and open formats and, and all that with them. And, you know, there are some open source graphics applications. I think Inkscape is like by far more viable than than most of them. If you ever tried to use GIMP, you're probably not a, not a fan, but I don't know if anyone's actually tried to do that. Uh, and, the, and the thing is, too, is that, I mean, I do use Adobe products from time to time. I, I'm not, it's not like a guilt thing, but I just, I find them less valuable over time, and it's kind of a bad habit that I need to kick. I mean, maybe it's because I work in the web, so, like, all browsers at this point can render SVG, like, really well. So, very few times do you actually need to go into Photoshop to make an icon anymore. You can, you can do it in, in, in Inkscape, and you can send it to the client as an SVG, and it'll look great. And even if you still need a PNG, uh, Inkscape's output is actually really good. I think it's better than Illustrator, but I have a lot of gripes about Illustrator. I mean, really, the thing is about Photoshop and Illustrator, I mean, they're for, like, print design and photographers, and I've been using it I've been u abusing those tools to get what I needed for the web for a long time. But with CSS3, I mean, I don't need an image to make a drop shadow anymore. We live in a totally different world. You don't have to get all adobe up. <laughs> and, I mean, I don't know. I mean, most of us are probably designing for the web anyways. That's, that's sort of where most of my advice is going to come. So, I mean, just use HTML and CSS. And the truth is, is that if you were a room full of designers, and you guys all believe me. Okay, I'm going to design an HTML and CSS. How much more serious would you take those people when they submitted something to you? This is a collaborative format. They've shown that this can actually work in a web browser. It's not like some, you know, 300 DPI PSD that I have to 
you know, take to my brother-in-law's computer, just like slice, and it's like some nightmare. And this is, this is, they're already speaking your language. And, you know, like if you do need icons, use Inkscape. There's also a lot of icon projects out there, like the Noun project. And now the big thing is to use, like, a font that has all the icons in it. And, I mean, there's a lot of cool tricks. You don't have to, you don't have to be great at, like, illustration and graphic arts to, to get good at designing user interfaces. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't explore designing and, and actually doing art. I'm just, I just think that the barrier is a lot lower for engineers because the technology that we've built with HTML and CSS and SVG is so supportive of, of, of all the technologies we're already familiar with. And, um, you know, I mean, consider drawing stuff on paper. Maybe learning how to draw your favorite animal. Um, maybe make something that's not a GUI, you know? I, I think that the great opportunity that designers have when they're learning, or engineers have, sorry, when they're learning engineering, is that they can do stuff that designers can't. Uh, there's, there's libraries like Raphael.js and, and D3. They're like graphics libraries. And, you know, you can make infographics that are based on live data and APIs, stuff that's like way out of most people's league who are interested in making infographics. But this is easier for us to do. We already understand that stuff. And, you know, uh, has anyone ever used Blender before? It's an open source 3D application. Okay, I got really good at 3D Studio Max back in the day when it was like the thing. And I mean, Blender was really, really hard to adapt to, but it is really powerful. And I mean, if you're interested in it, you know, it's there. But the cool thing about it is that you, is it has a Python interpreter. So you can write code that generates art. Basically, I'm just saying, step outside your comfort zone and get serious about adjacent crafts. I'm really focusing on design because I think that that is a really, really critical link. But there's probably a lot of other adjacent fields that we could get more serious about. My weakness is system administration. I'm, an, I'm like a nightmare at the console. And I, I, I need to work on that. But the more that we know about the things that are around us, the fewer mistakes we're going to make. The better the stuff that we're making is going to be. And, you know, you might find a passion you didn't know was there. But this is a room full of hackers, so I'll just tell you not to. And perhaps then you'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure I have a lot of time for questions, so if anybody has any, feel free. Yeah? Yeah. I've, oh man, I've been there. Yeah, so basically you work in an environment where the designers feel like they're in like the God position and they can declare what shall be and that any feedback isn't really well taken. And uh, like the kind of feedback you're giving uh, is probably pretty reasonable. Like you're not trying to redesign the whole thing necessarily, but you're just like, you know, this, yeah. So. I've definitely experienced this, and I, I think that over time, I think I've gotten older and I've like picked fewer fights. But in the end, like what wins is if you disagree on something, prove to me, because I have proof that this is a problem. I, there's a technical reason why this is a problem, or I, I have a suspicion that that this is that these are too many too many steps or whatever it is. And you need to prove to me, user test it, do something to prove to me. Don't just come at me with your opinion. I, I think that in the end, the data, demanding data is a totally rational thing to do. And in the end, the data always wins. Unless you have really, really screwed up management. But I can't solve that. But, but that's, that's been the case at Wikipedia. And we, we've become more, um, more comfortable with the idea of de demanding that designers work in CSS and HTML, although not all of them like that idea, and some of them were kicking and screaming as we shifted towards that. The newer people we've hired, we've kind of looked for those skills. And, uh, and I think also maybe suggesting that engineers and designers be uh, kind of together earlier on. Because usually what happens, and I, I've been in this situation as, as a designer, 
is that design is just, it, it feels different. Like you create something and it's kind of like this like baby and like anything that anyone does to pick it apart, it makes you feel like they're not appreciating what is there. And it's, it's, it's not really a great um, way for people to think about things, but it's incredibly common. I've felt it myself. So the best time to give that feedback is like really, really early on. And, but the problem is, of course, that you're probably experiencing is that uh, most of the time when the designers say, let's have a meeting to talk about the future of like what we're going to do, they don't ever think to talk to an engineer because they think of you as later down on the path perhaps. It depends on the organization. Like I, I don't mean to generalize all designers because like in our organization it, it's changed and now designers are much more concerned with, well, I don't want to spend all this time doing this if I'm just going to get shot down. And, and it's, it's happened that we've had designers who spent like a whole year working on various projects and none of them have come to fruition because they completely disregarded all of the engineering constraints and we just go, we simply cannot do that even if we wanted to, which we're not so even so sure we do. And I think finally, um, I don't know how well this will go in your organization. In our organization, engineers have the final plus two on things, on actual code changes. And if you are going to approve somebody else's, when I say plus two, we use Garrett. I'm sorry, this is totally like lingo. That means like I'm okay with this being merged into master and we're gonna actually do this. If you guys are on an SVN and it's like post commit review, it's a little bit harder to do this gatekeeping. But for us, we do this gatekeeping mechanism and it's great because if a designer is like, I'm gonna do this, and sometimes they even write their own patch, everybody gets to talk about it before it actually gets applied. And it really like, it makes it so those discussions happen rather than them sneaking things in. And then they're like three months into a project and the project manager is like, just implement it as it is. Just, we just need to, you know. So, so I think that the trick is just get in early. It's, that's pretty much it. Yeah? Yes. And they just understand these things because they, just, you know, they don't know the inner workings. And it's really just a matter of sort of sharing that knowledge so that it's not just that. And the thing is, all that. Yeah. I mean, I guess basically what you're kind of saying is you had this experience where people came up with very impractical ideas yeah. and, uh, and kind of felt like you were limiting their creativity and telling them it wasn't going to happen. And I think that's what's so empowering about learning two disciplines is that when I think about designing something, I'm, I'm automatically aware of all of the technical implications of that. I, I, I'm actually uh, a front-end engineer at Wikimedia, and I work on um, a project that is making it possible to edit Wikipedia pages uh, visually with, instead of having to write wiki text. And it's, it's, it's very, there's tons of intersection between the user experience and the technical issues. And, you know, there's been tons of people who've come up from a technical standpoint only and, a, and from a design standpoint only, and they've all failed. And what works better is when you kind of understand both concerns and you can kind of make those negotiations in your own head rather than having to constantly negotiate with someone else. That's a lot of fighting just to get somewhere. And so it, it's, it's really valuable. And it, even if you're going to work with someone who's just a designer, if you could speak their language, they're going to have a different level of respect for you. And you're, you're going to be able to speak to them in terms that they're going to like understand instead of reject. So, I think I'm up. Yep. Thank you guys so much.